Welcome to the Fundamental Health Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Saladino. This podcast is the result of my relentless search to understand and correct the roots of chronic disease and illness. In this podcast, I will share with you everything I have learned about how to live the most healthy and radical life possible. Thanks for joining me on this journey. What is up, you guys? Welcome to another edition of the Fundamental Health Podcast. As you all know, I deeply believe that it is your birthright to some pretty freaking amazing health, to strength, to vitality, to libido, to mental clarity, to happiness, and to kicking a whole lot of ass. I'm grateful for all of the experience that I've had in my life, in medicine and personally, I'm grateful for the knowledge that I acquired that allowed me to change my diet, to change my eczema, to live a little more radically. And what we are about at Heart and Soil and what this podcast is all about is equipping you with the nutrition and the information to really reclaim your birthright, your ancestral birthright, to freaking profoundly radical health. So as you guys know from all of my travels, from all of my research, I strongly believe that organs are the crux of this. So get organs in your diet. And if you need help getting organs in your diet, check us out at heartandsoil.co. We have grass-fed, grass-finished, desiccated organs sourced from regenerative farms in New Zealand. And I think that a great place to start would be with bone marrow and liver. That would be a fantastic first supplement for many of you to start with. Six capsules a day will get you nose tail nutrition that will be, and there is no hyperbole in the statement, life-changing for many of you, I believe. But getting organs in your diet is the cheat code. It is a huge stepping stone and an accelerant on your way to radical health. So reclaim your birthright to radical health. Check us out, heartandsoil.co. That is my passion project, you guys. This week on the podcast, Stephen Gundry author of The Plant Paradox, physician, previous car- cardiac surgeon, now in private practice. I am impressed by the fact that in his early 70s or late 60s, he continues to practice and see patients many days per week. He's clearly passionate about what he does. Um, we begin the conversation talking about lectins, and he talks a little bit of aquaporins, which is a special type of channel that could be cross-reactive in humans, and he and I agree that Beans, nuts, seeds, and grains have no place in the human diet, healthy human diet. And furthermore, that spinach and kale and chard are not awesome for you either. And then the gloves come off a little bit and we debate. So I know you guys will enjoy our different views on fiber. I think that uh, he admitted in this podcast that fiber was not good for everyone. And uh, some of the statements that he made in his newest book, The Energy Paradox, seemed a little bit far-fetched to me, so I wanted to challenge him on those, and um, you can listen to the previous podcast I've done with Stephen on his podcast, in which we go head-to-head on meat and mTOR and all that stuff, and then we talk about gasotransmitters, and then we move on to talk about fructose, and my strong assertion is that fructose, as you heard in a previous Controversial Thoughts video about honey, is not the same when it is a whole food, evolutionarily consistent form like fruit versus honey and that he is conflating a lot of animal and reductionist data in his book, uh, especially with regard to ceramides and insulin resistance. So uh, you can listen to the CGM podcast to see my results. Clearly, honey does not cause insulin resistance in humans. I think I've shown that very, very clearly. So enjoy this friendly debate with my friend, Stephen Gundry. Hello, Dr. Gundry. Thank you for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be with you, my friend. Hey, Paul, thanks for inviting me. I've, uh, you know, I think when last time you were on my podcast, I said, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll come on yours and thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. You know, I, I had a great time on your podcast. I'll link to the podcast that we did previously on yours. We, we talked about a lot of the, the things. Maybe we'll touch on a little bit at the end of the podcast today if we have fun, but we talked about mTOR and meat and all these kind of longevity issues. But I, I want to talk about a few new things today, but I want to start with uh, a quote that I heard you say, which is amazing. So I heard you talking to Mark Hyman, and you said that some people consider you the grandfather of the carnivore diet. And I thought that was so awesome. 
But the reason that they might consider you that is because of your work highlighting lectins. And so I thought, I want to get into your new book, Energy, The Energy Paradox. But before we do that, I just wanted to get it, you know, to have you tell us a little bit about lectins, why you're concerned about them, and what they are and how they've been a part of your practice and improving patients' outcomes by eliminating them. So you're the guy to talk about it. Yeah, uh, you know, plants, as we've talked about before, quite frankly, do not want to be eaten. They, they were not put here for us, I assure you. They, uh, they were put here for them. And they, their defense system is, as you and I know, they are alchemists of incredible ability. And they produce compounds, among which are lectins, which are there, I think, to dissuade their predators, animals like us, that they probably shouldn't eat these things. And uh, I'll give you a, a perfect example. I was out walking the other day, and there's here in Palm Springs, we have lots of prickly pear cactuses. And uh, I could even pull up the picture and the, the prickly pear cactus, of course, has tons of thorns on it. And if you take the, if you take there, right. Uh, okay. Right. So yes. now if, if I tried to eat that, uh, I certainly would get poked by these thorns. And so it's got a great defense system against being eaten, but if I burned those spines off and then peeled the cactus, I would have nopale, which quite frankly, I think is really good for you. But the point is the plant didn't want you to do that. And so that's an obvious defense system. What's not obvious that my critics and your critics would say is, well, I look at a bean and there aren't any spines on a bean and it tastes really good. And so, what are you talking about? The lectins are so bad for you. But lectins are proteins that are designed, uh, thanks to the work of Dr. Fasano from Hopkins and now Harvard, show that these are instrumental in creating leaky gut. And if COVID has taught us anything, is that leaky gut is literally underlying all disease processes and all pre existing conditions. And so why wouldn't you want to eliminate some of the big mischief makers in leaky gut? And, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Greger just uh, wrote another article the last couple of days attacking me <laughs> and saying that beans are so good for you and why am I so anti-bean? And I'm not anti-bean. But I'm certainly anti-beans in their, you know, uncooked state and in the state that we normally cook them in. And even Joel Furman uh, now admits that he pressure cooks his beans before he eats them. And it's like, really, why do you do that? You know, if they're so good for you. Um, so that's a long winded way of saying, yeah, um, these plants have systems to protect themselves. And when I started all this, some people when the carnivore diet you know, came about said, we're just following what you said. You know, if most plants don't like us, then all plants probably don't like us. And so, you know. <laughs> in a way, maybe I took up your mantle. I, you know, people expected you to go that direction and that's where I went. And my audience will certainly know that. But from what I've seen, and I wrote about lectins in my book, The Carnivore Code, they're generally most concentrated in the plant babies, which is probably terminology that you've used in the past too. The yep. seeds, the, seeds, the, the yep. beans, the nuts, and the grains, which are all actually plant seeds. But as we know, you know, there are some fruits, quote unquote, like a tomato that have lectins, which are particularly immunogenic in the skin and the seeds. And squash appears to have lectins in the skin and the seeds. And, and the so, seeds, correct. Yeah. So I think that the majority of the time, do you think it would be safe to say that if you if you cut out plant seeds, you're gonna get rid of most lectins with a few caveats. Yeah, and there are a few surprising caveats that I've learned actually subsequent to our previous interview. Um, there are a class of lectins that are called aquaporins. And aquaporins are among other things, present in spinach. Um, they are present in soybeans, they're present in uh, bell peppers, they're present in potatoes, they're present in corn. 
And these aquaporins uh, actually are one of the best ways to cause leaky brain, in my experience, um, and leaky gut. And we don't have to go down that rabbit hole, but there, yeah. So there are leaves that contain lectins that we probably shouldn't be eating either. Um, darn it. <laughs> no, I don't mind. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you don't mind. <laughs> I, I basically have a t-shirt that says I'm the anti-broccoli crusader. You know, the spinach is not your friend is my, is my, my mantra. So I heard you say once and it, it made me so happy. There is no need for spinach, kale or chard in your diet. And I was like, yes, yes, Stephen, I agree with you there. So that's awesome. So hopefully people will, will understand that context. And I think that we both understand that plants don't want to get eaten and we should really give some context to which parts of the plants might have toxins and move forward. So in that point, we are completely aligned. So you've got this new book coming out called The Energy Paradox. And I was reading through it over the last few days. There are some really interesting points I want to discuss, but I thought it was so interesting that you mentioned the Hadza in your book. So I, I don't know if you know this, but I just got back from Tanzania. This no. Is, this is my Tanzania beer. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so I spent a week hunting and living with the Hadza, these hunter gatherers. And I, I think it's very interesting because as you point out in the book, there's a quite an interesting study looking at the energy expenditure of the Hadza versus desktop workers. And I'll let you explain that one in a moment. But the Hadza are generally regarded as pretty darn healthy. And that was what I observed. And so I think you appropriately point out in the book that the Hadza are a hunter-gatherer culture that seems to have avoided chronic disease, right? That's something that yep. you them. So, so tell us a little bit about their energy expenditure relative to desktop workers and what you think is going on there. So um, researchers actually from Duke University uh, initially did these studies and they, they had a hypothesis, which was a really good hypothesis that, you know, the Hadza's, uh, the men walk, oh, eight, 10 miles a day. The women walk three to five miles a day, you know, gathering and oh, geez, Paul, you didn't eat all the tubers they ate, did you? Oh my! I'll tell God. you about the tubers. I have a story for you about the tubers. I <laughs> did eat all the right. tubers so, because I'm a. I oh wanted to God. be an. Exp yeah, I did eat the tubers, but I'll tell you about them. Yeah. And you're not dead. That's amazing. I didn't die, but we <laughs> we spit out the fiber. So this this is coming. There's all there's right. there's a punchline here. All right. So anyhow, so they they looked at the energy expenditure of the Hadzas and they compared it to desk workers. And their hypothesis was that the Hadzas are so fit and trim because they're using up tons of energy and the desktop workers are just sitting there doing nothing. And lo and behold, when they actually looked at energy expenditure, they found that the Hadzas and the desktop workers actually used up the same amount of energy expenditure every day. Now, you know, you're, you're, when your hypothesis doesn't work out right, um, you often make up a new hypothesis. And these guys concluded, and I've actually recently had them on a podcast, that this proves that all of us, no matter what, extend the, expend the same amount of energy every day, and there is a fixed amount of energy that we will expend. And it, that did not pass the sniff test, I'm sorry. So um, as you probably found out, you uh, probably expended a lot of energy. Um, so what were these workers doing that was so energy intensive and it was creating inflammation? And inflammation, then again, our white blood cells are our army, if you will, and our troops require huge amounts of fuel in, in, in any war. And what when we have leaky gut, we have 80% of our entire immune system lined up on the wall of our gut in our belly because that's where mischief is coming across. And so I submit that the reason the energy expenditure in these desk workers was so high, like a hunter gatherer, was that most of that energy, most of that fuel was going to fuel our immune system and creating the fire of inflammation. And quite frankly, if all of your fuel is going to make inflammation, you don't have a lot left over for your muscles, for your brain. And that's really the paradox, the energy paradox. Uh, it's going in the wrong place. I, I certainly think that most desk workers and most people who eat a Western diet are 
very much inflamed. And certainly that could be leading to some energy expenditure. So it's a very interesting kind of discordance. The, I guess the other hypothesis is maybe the Hadza have figured out evolutionarily a way for their body to conserve the energy and doing all of this exercise, they don't have more energy when they're walking around. They don't have huge energy expenditures because I can tell you, and I need to look at the paper more specifically, I don't know if they adjusted for body size and mass, the Hadza are pretty small men and women. Uh, most of the yes. guys, most of the guys were five two, and I imagine they adjusted for that for, you know, yeah, a, you know, you know, size and height and BMI with the Correct. energy expenditure. But there was something you said on page fourteen that I wanna, I wanna, um, I wanna embellish a little bit, or I wanna make a little more detailed. You said the Hadza eat a clean diet comprised of fiber-rich plants and lean animal meat. And then on page 47, you said that the Hadza, like other hunter-gatherers, eat 150 grams of fiber per day. So based on my experience, this is false. And I don't know, yeah. if, you, I don't know if you've been to see any of the hunter-gatherer tribes, the Akun, which I want to go visit as well, or the Hadza. But when we ate the tubers, Stephen, we spit out the fiber. It was undigested. It was unchewable. It was the most fibrous thing I've ever eaten. So they, the main fiber we ate was, the main tuber we ate was called shumoko, I think. I dug it with the woman. I felt a little bit non-carnivore, non-animal based, but I wanted to try it. We peel off the outer skin right. and, you, and you eat it. And then it's basically like a mass of ropes in your mouth. You must spit it out. And speaking with the Hadza, they said to me, they spit out most of the roots. Like these tubers in the wild are almost entirely fibrous. As you've probably mentioned, things like sweet potato don't occur at, in Lake Iasi in Tanzania. There's nothing that starchy. The, they do sometimes cook the tubers on the fire, but most of the time they'll eat them raw and they are a mouthful of fibrous ropey stuff that then they then spit out. And so I really want to push back on this notion and have some of these anthropologists who are promulgating the notion that the Hadza are eating 150 grams of fiber a day on the podcast to say, did you actually observe that? Or are you including all that stuff they spit out in the fiber calculation? Because, <clears throat> so we were with them for a week and it was a week in, uh, it was a week in February and it was sort of between the, the dry season and the rainy season. Season, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we didn't stay a full year. You know, we didn't see everything they eat but we ate multiple types of tubers and we ate berries and we ate honey, which I wanted to tell you about. And then we also ate baboon. <laughs> and Janet Cat and Dick Dick, which is a, a small ruminant, like a deer. And yeah. <clears throat> that was essentially their whole diet and baobab fruit. And so it was very yeah. interesting to me. There was, it was a very low fiber diet. <laughs> like they really- Well, baobab fruit has huge amounts of fiber, Paul. But they Huge didn't... amounts of fiber. Well, In fact, but... as you... Yeah. you got... Have you ever eaten it? Thank have you ever eaten you... it? Yes, I have. Thank it's you. not In that fact, fibrous. I take it every day it more dissolves in your mouth. Like there's no real fiber in baobab unless they're counting the shell or the seeds, which they didn't eat. And but, the, the Hadza but weren't soluble running around. fiber. But the Hadza you're not weren't- gonna, you, yeah, You're yeah. not gonna feel the soluble fiber. And remember, we can't use insoluble fiber. So I would spit out those fibrous things too. Right, but we didn't, they weren't like eating baobab every day. We went to a baobab tree one day and said, hey, can we try this? And they picked up one or two fruits and ate it, but there can't be a whole lot of fiber in baobab. They're mostly seeds and you pick off these little pieces of baobab and it's just not that much. To suggest they're eating 150 grams is, it's not possible based on what I observed. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that you left out the honey and the fruit. <laughs> The baobab. Oh, I agree berries. with the honey. No, I actually, I say that during the other season, they eat a lot of honey. And they the eat a lot of honey. So yeah. I went hunting for honey with them and they treasure honey. So we, we got honey on two or three occasions and some of the hives were large and there was no, there was no consideration. We'll talk about fructose a little bit later in the podcast. There was no consideration for fructose or ceramides or anything. They went to town on the honey. I mean, these guys ate, we ate all of it. I think we ate at least 150 grams per person of honey, which is gonna have sucrose and fructose. So it's important. I just think that some of these- But wait a minute, guess yeah. what? Yeah. They weren't eating it every day, Paul. They did eat it every day I was there. 365 days a year, they don't. They do not have honey every day. 
I mean, but they ate it every re- single day that I was there. Of course, because you were in the honey season, but they don't have it every day. Just they have like, it a lot. Just like an orangutan only eats fruit in fruit season and gains seven pounds, and they gorge on 5,000 calories a day of fructose to do what? To store fat for the winter. And that's exactly what these guys do. Mm, and I'm fruit- going to disagree with fructose. you there you and you're a fructose fan oh we'll my talk gosh about the it. original carnivore oh we you're will, breaking my heart we will you're talk about my heart it. they they had no fear of honey or fruit and they ate fruit of not. every day because that was the day. season and i tell people please during season have fruit in moderation that's the whole point but don't have it every day it is not 365 days of endless summer when we I know are, you're in Costa Rica now. It that's is, 365 though, days of in the summer. They're equatorial. They're in Tanzania. There are fruits and fructose available all year round for the Hadza. Great they, apes don't have it. Well, these are humans, not great apes. Yeah. Yeah. We're just a fat great ape. <laughs> well, no, we'll talk about this too, because I want to ask right. you about this, the gut stuff too. So, but when we asked them about their diet, they, they said there was always some fruit available they hunted honey every time they went out hunting, which was almost every day, they were looking for hives, they were looking for bees. And because it's equatorial, the bees are around all year. There isn't really a season where the honey doesn't arrive. And if you look at their consumption, and there are many tribes like this, they have a significant amount of their calories that are fructose containing foods. So I think we have to just consider this in this tribe of hunter gatherers in Africa that we both accept are pretty darn healthy. I mean, they were, yeah, I agree. I've, done, I've done podcasts, you know, talking about my experiences, but they are free from chronic disease. So it's interesting you brought up the great apes because I've heard you say something else and I just want to offer two opinions on this. So I've heard you suggest that um, it was fire that allowed us to get more calories and that perhaps changed the way our guts uh, looked. But when, when have you seen fire dated back the furthest? Because I see this a little differently. How old, what is the oldest fire relic that you're aware of? About 300,000 years. Right. And when I look at Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Homo sapiens, which was certainly around 300,000 years ago, but Homo erectus and Homo habilis, 1.5, Paranthropus, one, you know, 2 million years ago, this changing of the Australopithecine lineage, the rib cages began to change even then, and the rib angles. So if you look at the growth of the human brain, it began 2 million years ago. And so this is something that- I I, totally agree with you. Right, and so if our brains are growing and we're, I mean, there are multiple hypotheses here. There's the expensive tissue hypothesis, which posits that shrinking guts and bigger brains. If our brains are growing, we probably can infer that our guts are shrinking. And that's 1.7 million years before we see fire. So my, so I think it's more plausible. Doesn't it seem more plausible that it was the eating of meat and organs by these scavengers and then hunters that allowed our brains to grow, that allowed more nutrient-rich food to be consumed and absorbed, allowing the trade-off between the gut, specifically the large intestine, and the brain to happen for 1.7 million years before we got fire. How do we explain that? How can how can uh, how can how, any Harvard anthropologist explain that? Paul, how come there are no big brain carnivores in Africa? There aren't any. There aren't any. Eating meat doesn't make a big brain. It does in humans, <laughs> like no, humans. It, humans why? are a big brain carnivore. Yeah, but that's not from eating meat. How do you, how can you say that? It turns out the only large brain animals per body mass are animals that are aquatic and human. And they get omega-3 fats to build their brain from a totally different source. And if you haven't read it already, please read all of Elaine Morgan's books on how we're an aquatic ape. And Where do we get the omega-3 fats if we're not getting them from animals, right? So we can, you can, you can say- oh, get We get them from shellfish. We were, that's, that's, current, that's meat, we, right? Yeah, yeah, we're not hunting big game on the, on the African belt. What and are you we talking about? That's exactly what we shellfish. were doing. We, that the Hadza are- 
Oh, the Hardza are inland. This is the, the Rift yeah. Valley in Africa is inland. It is not a coastal place. That is where the first- Wait a minute, the Rift Valley was actually where large lakes and rivers were at the time that these animals were going. Exactly. And the whole aquatic, yeah. So not we that much were an aquatic there. gatherer. Oh, there's tons. And also <laughs> there's the Nile catfish. The Nile catfish is actually the most intense omega-3 fat containing fish there is. And the cool thing about the Nile catfish is it can live in mud during the dry season. So we had, and you'll notice that all of these specimens have large amounts of fish and shellfish so in, the, you know, in the burial areas where they were found. So, uh, and we can debate that forever, but let's talk about energy. <laughs> yeah, I think we disagree on that. I think there's plenty of evidence that humans were breaking bones, getting marrow, whether it was omega-3. Sure, they were looking for marrow. Or other meat-based nutrients. I mean, the Hadza ate brain. I ate baboon brain with the Hadza. So any animal we killed, we were getting the, the brain and all the omega-3s. And I think the omega-3s were part of a myriad collection of nutrients that allowed our brains to grow. But I think it had nothing to do with cooking and certainly nothing to do with fiber because that doesn't come along until much later. But remember the tubers and like um, the nuts were actually a major source of fiber that sustained humans at around a hundred thousand years ago. Uh, and you know, we had this, you know, the second great exodus out of, out of Africa, probably 60,000 years ago. And it was always along oceanfront rivers. That's where all humans dispersed. It wasn't across plains uh, hunting animals. Are we really good at killing animals? Don't get me wrong. We're really good at killing animals and eating animals. So you and I would agree with that. Um, wherever humans went, we did a really good job of killing off every species we could find. Right, right. And I think that there's, we could, we, I don't want to belabor the point, we'll move on. But I think that we're debating now whether it was fish or aquatic life or terrestrial life that humans were eating. But yeah. I don't think it was plants that had anything to do with the expansion of the human brain or the change in the human gut. Yeah, and I, I will agree with that as well. Yeah. How's that? That's good. Okay. So moving on to the energy paradox. So uh, one of the things you talk about first are the microbiome. And this is interesting to me because you talk about gasotransmitters and I want to dig into this. So gasotransmitters, these are like hydrogen sulfide, right? And you said on page 48, when your gut buddies aren't uh, fed the, few, the foods they need to maintain or to make anti-inflammatory energy producing signaling molecules, rampant inflammation is likely to take hold. And you're referring to fiber there, right? You're referring to plant fiber as the thing that your gut buddies need to make hydrogen sulfide. Is that correct? Uh, that's one way to do it. You mm -hmm. can actually ferment amino acids to do it. Exactly. So this is my point that if you look at hydrogen sulfide and other gasotransmitters in the gut, they are derived from cysteine. They are derived from amino acids. And there are plenty of articles out there, and I'll pull one up, um, that really suggests that it's that there is either a an endothelial or a bacterial or perhaps both of these that sources for the production of hydrogen sulfide. So, from your perspective, why do we need to get fiber if we can make it from amino acids? Well, so hydrogen sulfide is just one of the postbiotics that is important. But what's interesting about hydrogen sulfide? like I say in the energy paradox is there's a Goldilocks rule in all hormetic postbiotic gases where none is not very good for you, some is really good for you, and a lot is really bad for you. And hydrogen sulfide falls into that hormetic signaling um, Goldilocks rule. And one of the proposals about where that hydrogen sulfide comes from is that if you have a primarily high animal protein diet, you're going to tip over out of the Goldilocks rule area into more hydrogen sulfide, which then becomes a toxin. And I think both you and I can agree that a lot of hydrogen sulfide is toxic. 
I would agree with that. And I have not seen any studies in humans to support the fact that meat would lead to excess hydrogen sulfide production in any way, shape or form. So this is a hypothesis or but there are, at best. But there are animal studies that suggest that. You would agree with that? Well, let, let's talk really? about the animal study that you cite here because I was not happy with this one, Stephen. <laughs> So let of me, course you're not happy with of it. Of course <laughs> I'm not happy with it. So I want to show this one. So this is, um, this is one of the studies that I think is important for people to be aware of. And it's just the fact that cysteine derived hydrogen sulfide in gut health, a matter of endogenous or bacterial origin. And they're saying that cysteine degradation by the microbiota, so this is an amino acid, is the dominant pathway for H2S production. So we actually need amino acids to make hydrogen sulfide. Fusobacterium is a pivotal genus, which is interesting. Um, and we can look at my gut uh, results if we want to see what fusobacterium populations look like. Oh, I wish you'd left it back up there because it <laughs> says double-edged sword. And... <laughs> well, yes, there's a hormetic effect. <laughs> there see is that a... down there, summary? <laughs> yes, there is a hormetic effect. But so look, let's look at this one because this was something that I had a trouble with. So one of the papers that you mention in the book as a reference for a high sulfide, hydrogen sulfide diet was a high fat diet in mice. And I thought, well, this isn't really fair to use this as the main reference that is saying that a high fat, low fiber diet is causing hydrogen sulfide. Because number one, in this paper, perhaps you were able to read it more deeply than I was. It's a mouse study. And they're, they don't actually even talk about what fats they use in the study. I couldn't even tell. They say the, diet, the mice were fed uh, a high fat diet of 16% fat, 12.5% cholesterol, 5% sodium cholic acid, or a normal diet. And I have no idea what type of fat they fed these rats. Most of these, most of these mice studies are lard. Right, but it's a high linoleic acid lard, but we can't say that for sure. I mean, you can't be sure that it's lard. Like, I don't have any idea. We know that feeding mice linoleic acid is an absolute metabolic catastrophe. So we can't, I don't think it's fair to base the conclusion or the claim in the book that a high fat diet leads to excess hydrogen sulfide production without saying number one, that's only been shown in mice. And number two, they don't even talk about what the actual mixture of fat is in the study. They certainly didn't feed these mice tallow, right? As far as I can tell, I mean, they don't even talk about what they're doing here. So I'm not aware of any single study in humans that supports the claim that excess meat or high fat diet is going to be detrimental for hydrogen sulfide. Wait a minute. So now we're comparing meat to high fat. Um, well, presumably we meat can't... comes, presumably meat comes with saturated fat. Well, we can do high fat. If, I mean, how else are you going to get fat? Right? So we can say, Oh, it's a high fat diet, but most people will say saturated fat comes with meat. So yeah, but there's, we, there's no, well, no but wait, wait a minute. We could, we could go on a butter diet and I wouldn't be eating a animal meat diet. Yes, you could. I? And, but are there any studies to show that a butter diet puts you into a bad range of hydrogen sulfide? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of either. I'm not saying that you should either not eat a high butter diet or not have a butter diet because butter contains butyric acid. That's actually where the name comes from. Right. And butyric acid is one of those phenomenal short chain fatty acids that actually is used by our intestinal endothelial, particularly our colonocytes for maintenance. But butyric acid is one of the best postbiotics to supercharge your mitochondrial production and really forms the basis of the energy paradox. So have some butter folks, but there's a whole lot of easier ways to make butyric acid and that's to eat fiber. Or you don't have to eat fiber to make butyric acid. We know that butyrate can be used from ketones in the blood, or you can eat amino acids and make butyric acid. You can make propionic acid, acetic acid. There are so many, you can make isobutyric acid. So I talked about this on my podcast with Lucy Mailing multiple times. You don't have to eat plant fiber to make short chain fatty acids. This is one of the notions that I think is insidious and gets parroted so often. And butyric acid is not the only short chain fatty acid that's used by the colonic epithelial site cells for energy production, isobutyrate, propionate, acetate. And in fact, if you look at head to head studies, you know, we can see that 
there are plenty of short chain fatty acids produced with no fiber. Now, I think that people will know my stance on fiber. I'll just enumerate it so that it's out in the open. I think if you are eating fiber and you tolerate it, then great. But there are so many people that I work with and hear from who do so much better when they completely eliminate fiber from their diet that I think it's important to at least offer an opposite perspective to this one, suggesting that fiber is essentially a panacea. I mean, that was the message I got from the book, that you must have fiber. I mean, at one point you were saying, page your cardiologist and get broccoli instead of a statin. And I thought, oh boy, we're not going to agree on this one at all here. I think this is the completely wrong uh, recommendation. But I think it's so interesting. We need to remain open-minded to the fact that we are, we are pulling on threads that are fascinating. Postbiotics, critically important. The production of gas transmitters, critically important in the human body, gut. Uh, gut. Short-chain fatty acids, critically important. But it's bigger than fiber for humans. We are so well adapted that we can do it with sugars. We can do it with honey. We can do it with all sorts of things that are found in the natural environment. We can get a little fiber from fruit. We'll talk about fructose next. Or we can do it without any fiber at all. And Stephen, I can't even tell you how people are so happy when they cut fiber out of their diet sometimes because they feel so much better. Oh, and don't get me wrong. You know, I believe and use a carnivore diet as the ultimate elimination diet. And because there are absolutely a large number of people who, when their guts are wrecked, quite frankly, fiber is a real troublemaker, particularly raw fiber. And some of my people, I will, you know, have them nuke their vegetables until they're just mush and then give them little bits when we're reintroducing it. But your point, let's both agree that there are numerous ways to generate postbiotics and fiber from plants is definitely one good way to generate postbiotics. Now, there are a number of people in my practice, and again, my practice is 70, 80% autoimmune and leaky gut um, that cannot tolerate when I first see them because of the extreme degree of their leaky gut, fiber from plants. And so, but let's agree that if you tolerate fiber from plants, if you look at, I hate to bring it up, the blue zones. Oh these, boy. <laughs> these guys eat an awful lot of fiber from plants, Paul. We'll have to do a whole separate podcast on the blue zones. We can't, if, maybe if we have time, we'll go on the blue zones. I've, I've gone hard on the blue zones, Stephen. There's so much inconsistency and it's really a set of cherry picked data. There are so many places in the world where longevity is much higher than the average, you know, uh, city or state or country that are left out of the blue zones. So let's save the oh, blue zones. Oh, there's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah lot, that's, yes, them. It's, it's been avoided. But I think that I, like I said, if you tolerate fiber and don't have a problem with it, I don't have a problem with people eating it. As people will know, I've been in Costa Rica eating papayas because they're a tropical fruit and it's here, right? And I like them. And I want to experience these local fruits that grow on trees that I'm sure our ancestors were eating. And we'll talk about fructose in a moment. And, you know, it doesn't bother me, but I want people to understand that fiber is not the end all and be all. And you don't need fiber to make postbiotics, short chain fatty acids. And for a lot of people, eliminating fiber is crucial, at least in the beginning for gut healing. Now, I think you and I agreed in the beginning of the podcast that, hey, we are all about helping people understand a spectrum of plant toxicity. You and I might draw it a little differently, but I don't like spinach or kale or chard. I don't think you like those either. We talked about aquaporins and lectins. And so I don't want people thinking they have to be pushing in kale smoothies and spinach smoothies. I'm not a fan of broccoli. I think you like that one, but I think that, you know, the fiber thing, there's a lot of nuance here. There are multiple ways to get here and it's going to be different yeah, for let, individuals. I mean, let, let's put it this way. I like to get my sulfur from cruciferous vegetables. You like to get your sulfur from cysteine. Um, for me. You, know, you, 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 you say tomato, I say toma tomato. And we both probably say don't eat tomatoes. So. We both say don't eat tomatoes. So, okay. On page 52... And this is interesting because I'm curious how many carnivores are in your practice. You say the most common complaint among keto and carnivore dieters is constipation. 
but that's not really what I have observed. And people are probably familiar with this study. I'm sure you've seen this one. This is a famous one from 2012 in which they yep. actually they actually removed fiber from the diet of people with idiopathic constipation and the constipation resolved completely. So clinically and in interventional studies like this one in the literature, the notion that fiber is necessary for constipation resolution is not supported. Now I'll just say this and then I'll let you comment. The nuance here is that constipation clinically is more than just stool volume. It's pain with passage of stool, straining, bleeding, use of laxatives. And it's very clear in the literature, um, though you can disagree with me if you have literature to, to, um, to corroborate your position. It's very clear in the literature that fiber does nothing to improve the symptoms of constipation. Now, the nuance here is that when people decrease the amount of fiber in their diet, fiber won't do pain, bloating, bleeding or use of laxatives. That's very clear in the literature. Fiber will increase stool volume. And so this is where the confusion I think lies is a lot of people when they go to an animal-based diet or a carnivore diet and they decrease their fiber, their stool volume gets smaller. They get more dainty bowel movements and they think I'm constipated, I'm backed up, which isn't the case. So in regions of the year or time when I'm doing a zero fiber carnivore diet, and just to be fair, I'll, I, like I said, I am not eating zero fiber right now. I eat papayas. Um, but when I have a zero fiber carnivore diet, my bowel movements are once a day and they're much smaller. But that doesn't mean I'm constipated. They're easy to pass. I don't have straining and stool. So I think this is a really important thing to, to discuss. And I also wonder how the people in your practice are constructing a carnivore diet. And if they need any help with that, I hope they'll send, you'll send them my way or at least get some organs in their diet or some desiccated organ supplements like we make it hard in soil because they got to get the organs. And so I'll let you respond to all of that. All right. The whole fiber bit got all screwed up by Dennis Burkett. Yes, it the, did. The English surgeon. He was, a, he was a colon surgeon who went down to Africa on missionary work to actually go operate on colon cancer and hemorrhoids. And he couldn't find any hemorrhoids and colon cancer. So he became obsessed by following these Africans out into the field. And he became obsessed with their giant mounds of poop. And he said, what the heck is uh, is this from? And he's wearing a lot of tubers and obviously weren't spitting all, all the fiber because he said, oh my gosh, it's the fiber. He went back to England. England did not have a lot of soluble fiber, but they had oodles of insoluble fiber in terms of grains. So he equated insoluble fiber with soluble fiber. And he's kind of, my humble opinion, the father of how people think that grain-based fiber, which is really bad for you, it's mostly insoluble fiber, is the cure-all of everything. And when I see people with constipation, I take away their whole wheat bread, I take away their wheat germ, I take away their insoluble fiber, and that is what was irritating their bowel and causing their constipation. So Fiber is not fiber is not fiber. And in the energy paradox, I hope I do a pretty good job of breaking down why fiber is not fiber. And there are some pretty interesting good fibers and there are some pretty nasty fibers. And we can't lump them together in a paper. There certainly is some fair, nuance here. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. There certainly is some nuance here, but I think it's important to understand that fiber is not the answer to constipation all of the time for people. And hey, I mean, we talked about it. Baobab fruit has more soluble fiber. We're back to the fruit, Stephen. Let's talk soluble about- Soluble fiber is good for you. <laughs> let's talk about fruit and fructose and ceramides because this is really important. And uh, people may need to re-listen to this part coming up because we're about to get a little technical, all right? So in the energy paradox, you talk about a paradigm and correct me if I- explain any of this incorrectly, in which you are saying fructose consumed by humans leads to the formation of palmitate, presumably in the, through de novo lipogenesis in the liver. Correct. Correct. Now, now you are moving on to then say that palmitate leads to the production of ceramides in mitochondria, palmitate moving out of the liver into the bloodstream leads to ceramides in the mitochondria. And is that fair to kind of say this fructose paradigm here? Yeah, well, palmitate is 
if you make ceramides from palmitate, that becomes one of the biggest mischief makers in producing insulin resistance. We use ceramides to literally keep our fat cells from bursting. And you and I would agree that fat cells bursting is a bad thing. Uh, so ceramides are a protective mechanism to actually strengthen the cell wall, cell membrane of fat cells. In the process of doing that, since insulin's job is to take sugar and put it into fat cells, fat cells become more and more resistant to the action of insulin, and it takes more and more insulin to get past the ceramide barrier. And so it's, they can't even, we're not even talking about mitochondria, we're talking about the membrane of the, of the adapt site. So palmitate from uh, fructose production is one of the best ways to make ceramide. Okay. Okay. See, we're going to disagree on this here. Um, let's talk about what we know about fructose utilization in humans versus animal studies. And I think this is dangerous because these end up getting mixed up quite a bit. Are you aware, have you seen the tracer studies looking at the actual amount of fructose that is made into palmitate via de novo lipogenesis in humans? It's extremely low. It's very, very low. There is really no significant production of palmitate from fructose in humans via de novo lipogenesis. And I have a real bone to pick with, with Robert Lustig because he likes to suggest that this is not the case by using, again, mouse studies, which cannot be used here because mice and humans have very different biochemistry when it comes to fructose. And we should not be surprised by this because, well, when is a mouse going to eat fructose? And so here is, or at least fructose absent actual fruit. So if you look at studies like this, fructose metabolism in humans, what isotopic tracer studies tell us, these studies show us that very low amounts of fructose, and this is not even fructose in fruit, this is pure fructose being administered to people. The mean conversion rate from fructose to glucose was 41%. So almost half of the fructose we eat becomes glucose That's immediately. And then 25% of it, even more of it, becomes, uh, becomes lactate. And then a very small amount goes to de novo lipogenesis and a very small percentage ends up in triglycerides. So I fear that we are massively overestimating the conversion of this saccharide, this carbohydrate into palmitate in humans. But if you do human studies comparing sucrose injection ingestion versus glucose ingestion, you find the exact opposite. The glucose has no effect in making palmitate, whereas sucrose, which is half fructose, does indeed. And I think our problem is in our diet with almost everything having high fructose corn syrup in it and our fruit being bread for sugar content, we've done ourselves a huge disservice. Uh, an apple now is about uh, the size of a grapefruit. And when I was growing up, an apple was about the size of what we now have a crab apple. And it was only available during certain times of the year. And I have no problem with saying, hey, eat some fructose if you want to produce some fat for the winter, because we know from great apes, and guess what, we carry the same metabolism as great apes do, will convert fructose and fruit into fat, which seems very logical. Very small amount, but we just, I just showed you that de novo lipogenesis is minuscule. They, that's because they gave them minuscule amounts. Our no. diet is a wash in sh sugar. I'm going to disagree with you there. So you, you got to agree where our diet is a wash in sugar. I would agree with that, but I also okay. push back against reductionist thinking in nutrition. And I, I'm glad we could have this conversation because when I heard you say on your video, talking about the energy paradox in your podcast, that apple you're reaching for is contributing to problems. I kind of, I don't think so because let's think about the Hadza. They're not avoiding berries. 
They're not avoiding honey. They eat fruit all year round as different fruits come into season. Are you aware of any study in humans using actual whole food fruit showing that that increases ceramides or palmitate? Oh, great question. Believe it or not, I've had a number of my patients who have read the book, and I won't even mention the name, that you should go on a high fruit diet to cure your diabetes. And that's because they claim based on animal studies that we don't convert fructose into pulmonate and we do not activate the de novo lipogenesis in the liver from fructose. Well, lo and behold, when my diabetic patients did that, they went from a hemoglobin A1C of six to a hemoglobin A1C of 12 in three months following this program. And we've done it repeatedly when we took their fructose away from them in the form of whole fruit, that's all they ate it plummeted back down to normal. So all I can tell you in my patients and everybody listening, I see patients six days a week from sunup to sundown, even on the weekends, when they want to try something, I'm all for it. I said, let's test it. Every one of them has failed this test. Now, it's important to note that these are diabetics. I would never recommend increasing carbohydrates to someone with pre-existing metabolic dysfunction. And perhaps I should have laid out that context previously. But, but 80% will... of the people who walk into my office have metabolic dysfunction. Exactly. And that's, and that's the purpose of the book, The Energy Paradox. And, and, but we need, to be, we need to be careful because some people who read your book are going to be metabolically healthy or they are going to become metabolically healthy, I believe by eliminating seed oils, and are going to continue avoiding foods that may be beneficial for them or serve a purpose in their life. But that's why in all my books, Paul, we have stages that when you get metabolically healthy again, we re-add these evil things back <laughs> into the diet. Okay, this, this let's, is not let's made clear not in the miss. book. <laughs> there this are stages, Paul. <laughs> okay, well, let me explain this. So I am a metabolically healthy fit male. I eat, and I did an experiment with a continuous glucose monitor and blood work monitoring over six months, eating honey twice a day, more than 100 grams of carbohydrates from honey twice a day. My CGM stayed good. My glycemic variability was very low. My postprandial glucose excursions were extremely low. My fasting insulin, do you want to guess? Less than three at the end of the study. My A1C, 4.7. It's very clear to me, at least in this laboratory and the people I work with, that in the absence of metabolic dysfunction, fructose, at least in the form of fruit and honey, like the Hadza would eat, is completely benign for humans. Now, we can take a very specific subset of people with massively disordered metabolic syndrome, right? Those people should not eat honey, and I've been very clear about that. Good. But I don't think that that's because necessarily of this mechanism. It's the fact that, hey, if your glucose metabolism is broken, if you are insulin resistant, don't put more glucose in your body. Of course, their A1C went up to 12. I just wanted to show you a study. I know you've got to go, but I found a pretty interesting study, Stephen, and they actually did give more fruit in combination with vegetables, but they gave young adults, presumably not metabolically unhealthy yet, increased amounts of fruit and vegetables and they looked at ceramides. And what did they find? That the adoption of a recommended dietary guidelines for Americans, fruit and vegetable intake for eight weeks, decreased waist circumference, systolic blood pressure, circulating cholesterol, lipidomics, and revealed that nutritional intervention can lower circulating ceramides. We probably don't have time to get into different ceramide subfractions, this paper came to a different conclusion than you did in your book. They said, well, actually, they'll notice that they saw an increase in C16 ceremonies, which is exactly what I talk about in the book. But so, they said here that we also look at, observed look at, improved inflammatory status. And they said, even though C16 was increased, suggesting that this form of ceramide is not associated with metabolic disease in humans. But they look at they say, unexpectedly, we observed an increase of C16. Apparently, they didn't read my book that would predict <laughs> that C16 would go up but look, from eating that, that. How can you argue? And Paul, that? did you see the re latest recommendations that we, oops, you know, those five servings of fruits and vegetables a day? We meant to say you should be eating 
three vegetables and only two fruits. And oh, by the way, most of the fruits that you think are, most of the vegetables you're eating are actually fruits. The government now has realized that this recommendation to eat fruit is wrong. And this paper actually proves that C16 is the mischief maker. And I disagree with the, you. The PREDIMED study showed that the C16 ceramide was the most predictor for heart disease. So I'm sorry, but, and unfortunately, we both agreed I do have a cutout that I gotta go on. But, but we cannot, you cannot ignore these people got metabolically healthier. Oh, I their, agree. Their overall <laughs> ceramides decreased. Where is the insulin resistance in these people, Stephen? Wait a minute, Paul. It doesn't we shove, here. We shove vegetables down their mouths and they got better? In addition uh, to two cups of fruit per day. We'll have to do a separate podcast about the fallacy of polyphenols. I knew you were gonna say that with the vegetables, but these people ate two cups of fruit. This is a human study showing that ceramides went down. This mechanism is wrong. C16 went up, Paul. Only That's a little bit. Maker. And they said- Unexpectedly and, went up. And they got metabolically healthier. That's so, from the other vegetables. No, it wasn't. <laughs> so let's just, I'll explain how I think the actual insulin resistance is happening and then I'll let you go. So as many of the papers dealing with ceramides will show us, ceramides are connected with fat cell expansion. They have nothing to do with, they have nothing to do with fructose in healthy humans. And as this one will show, that an oversupply of fat to tissues not suited for lipid storage induces cellular dysfunction that underlies diabetes and cardiovascular disease. This is exactly what I've talked about with Peter from Hyperlipid, Brad Marshall from the croissant diet, that it is seed oils, that it is excess omega-6 fatty acids like those you're recommending in sesame oil. You got to stop doing that, Stephen, that are disrupting insulin signaling. That's yeah. funny. Did you look at my paper that showed two tablespoons of sesame oil dramatically lowers blood pressure in hypertensive individuals? Why don't you look that paper up, Paul? Not a, you're increasing way uh, too much linoleic acid in, in these people. humans, Paul. A human Not a good study. thing. Not a good Human thing to be studies, a bunch Paul. of, no. Two, so, two tablespoons. Now you're interrupting me. <laughs> Basically, excess fatty acids going into these fat cells, making them overly distended. And that's when they start making ceramides, like you said, that leads yep. to insulin resistance. You need to listen to the podcast that I've done with Peter from Hyperlipid, looking at the NADH2 Love Hyperlipid. to FADH ratio, and Peter would not be excited about your sesame oil recommendation, Stephen. You are making people insulin resistant by overstuffing their fat cells with excess omega-6 fatty acids by recommending that. Now, to your credit, in the energy paradox, you warn people about seed oils and you talk about cardiolipin and the fact that excess omega-6, but I think you're missing the boat here with the sesame oil. So people can go back to the podcast that did with Tucker Goodrich on cardiolipin and mitochondrial dysfunction. So a lot yeah, of let's, be, here. let's be clear. I am not an omega-6 fan, and I make that very clear in the energy paradox. But uh, the interesting thing, I think there's a whole lot we have to learn about the benefits of the polyphenols in sesame oil as <laughs> sesame oil as a delivery device for sesame. And, uh, and we got and we gotta quit with that. And it's always it's head. always a pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to talk with you. It's a pleasure to talk with you. We'll have to talk more. I just hope that in the patients you have that are eating animal-based and carnivore, you're not recommending too much omega-6 fatty acids, that they get some- Not at all. That they get some organs in their diet with desiccated organ supplements. They're not doing the carnivore diet incorrectly or an animal-based diet in a way that's evolutionarily inconsistent. And I hope that you'll remember that the Hadza are super healthy. You're mentioning they in are. book. They I don't do. have high fiber diets. And one thing we don't mention, and we should, is the Hadzas like you and like me do time restricted eating. The Hadzas. Yeah, that's, they do. Okay. They do. They do. And that's but the, they, and that they eat, time they eat restrict, time, they eat restric year time restricted eating, as I show in my book, allows you to get away with a lot of things that otherwise you couldn't get away with. And that's the important work from DeCapo's studies at the NIH that I cite over and over again in the book. Uh, Time-restricted eating is so key to making any of these systems work for us. And interestingly, like a paper that you've talked about and that I've shown before with the Ramadan fast, time-restricted feeding 
the fasting increases acromancia. That's a whole separate conversation. Exactly. You That's don't need very fiber. True. You don't need fiber to increase acromancia when fasting increases acromancia. But going back to the Hadza, they're eating fruit year round. They're not becoming insulin resistant. So well, you got to live with them for a year. This fructose to palmitate to ceramides conversation is based on animal studies. It's something I really hope that you'll further consider because I think it's I think it's not complete. But anyway, thank you for coming on the podcast. I can't wait to have more conversations. We should I'll do another one on your podcast. We can keep talking about all this. That'll be great. We'll, we'll right. get you back. We'll get you back on. And thanks for right. having me on. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye bye. All right, guys. So interesting podcast with Stephen Gundry. Um, yeah, what can I say? Super nice guy, clearly knows what he's talking about, clearly believes in what he's doing. Um, we disagree on many things. We did not get to actually dig into mTOR. We did not get to dig into so many of these issues. Um, the polyphenols, it's just, I knew this wasn't going to be enough time for this conversation. Unfortunately, he only has 50 minutes because he's in his office seeing patients. But I think that we got to talk about a lot of different pieces of this equation. And I hope this conversation was valuable for you all. Um, there are many more places we could go down this rabbit hole. Uh, one of the things that he talks about in the book is melatonin and getting melatonin from pistachios. And I didn't have a chance to actually challenge him with data showing that pistachios also have lectins and also have allergen subunits like this paper shows um, the 11 S allergens from other seeds like pistachio, cashew, and soybeans. So that was interesting. And I wish I could have talked to him about that as well, but I am not a fan of pistachios. I'm not a fan of any nuts at all. I think it's going to cause many issues and problems. And we talked about some of that in the, um, in the actual podcast with him today. This is the study on Ramadan fasting, which I found to be quite interesting. Um, again, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see this Islamic fasting leads to an increased abundance of acromancia, mucinophilia, bacteroides fragilis group, a preliminary study on intermittent fasting. So this is fascinating to me because these are some of the bacteria that Stephen and others like Mark Hyman, who I am desperately trying to get on the podcast, um, I, I really want to have conversations with him. Um, if he is willing to do that, I hope he will engage. Um, there's such about acromancia, but acromancia goes up when you're fasting. So how can we say that fiber is necessary for this? And then one more study that I thought was fascinating, uh, gut microbiota mediate its intermittent fasting alleviation, uh, diabetes induced cognitive impairment. Again, intermittent fasting is probably a good thing for humans, even if you're not uh, even if you're not doing it for weight loss, your gut microbiota probably is affected positively by intermittent fasting. And believe me, the Hadza definitely have intermittent fasting as part of their life. So there are so many other places we could go with this. So many other things I could show. Um, there's, it's really probably not super fair to go too far down the rabbit hole without Stephen here to answer some of my criticisms, but there's one or two more studies that I would like to show you guys that we didn't have time for. So this one, for instance, the role of ceramides in insulin resistance. This is exactly what I was saying at the end of the podcast in the hypertrophied adipose tissue, as I've talked about with Peter from Hyperlipid and Brad Marshall. And how do you get hypertrophied adipose tissue? You get hypertrophied adipose tissue by eating excess omega-6 fatty acids. After adipocytes exceed their storage capacity, neutral lipids begin to accumulate in non-adipose tissue, inducing organ dysfunction. This is not fructose, guys. It's definitely not fructose from a moderate amount of fruit in your diet if you're metabolically healthy. Furthermore, obesity is closely related to the development of chronic inflammation and the release of cytokines directly from adipocytes or from macrophages that infiltrate adipose tissue. If you want to know more about ceramides, insulin resistance, fat cells growing too large. Listen to the many podcasts I have done on this, Ben Bickman, so many others. There is a literal library of things for you guys to look here on all of these things. So, all right, guys, thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all of you. 
If you like this podcast, please leave me a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. That is how I, how we spread the message of animal-based diets. What's interesting is that Stephen agreed, you don't need fiber. <laughs> but there are multiple ways down this rabbit hole. And that's what I wanted to push back on. He's saying in the book that fiber is the only way to support your gut buddies, the, the, gaso, the gasotransmitters. And I said, no way, you can get it many other ways. He also agreed that, you know, there's multiple pathways to insulin resistance. Fructose does not cause insulin resistance in whole foods in metabolically healthy humans. That is false. And I will keep pushing back on that. Not because I want you to eat honey all the time or, fr or fruit at the exclusion of more nutrient rich foods, but because these concepts are wrong and they're fear mongering and I think it's incorrect. And I'd like to, to push back on them because fruit is good and there's papaya growing on trees in Costa Rica. Of course, I'm going to eat this. And there's honey with the Hadza. And how can he say that the Hadza are not healthy? They're eating it all year round. They love the honey. So please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It's how we spread the important message of animal-based diets. These are the diets that I think humans are raised on. It's how the Hadza eat meat and organs. Check us out at Hardened Soil if you need more desiccated organs in your life. And don't fear fruit seasonally if you like. You don't have to. Get some honey if you want but I've seen it time and time again, ketogenic diets fail, strict carnivore diets fail because ketosis is not meant to be done long-term. Stephen and I would agree on that at least. So love you all, stay radical.